Sound waves are going to be the topic in this first lesson in a chapter on sound. Now, in this lesson, we're going to focus on the nature of sound waves and on the speed of sound in different mediums. Uh, but in the rest of the chapter, we'll talk about sound intensity levels or decibel levels. We'll talk about the Doppler effect and we'll talk about standing waves. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So let's start off by talking briefly about the nature of sound waves. And we actually brought this up and alluded to them in the last chapter on waves, but sound waves are what we call longitudinal waves. And we contrast that with uh, transverse waves. Now, a transverse wave we saw with like a wave on a string. And if I had a string laid out and I was so kind of oscillating on one end, so we'd see that the string at any one location was being displaced up and down, even though the wave itself was being propagated in the perpendicular dimension. And that's the hallmark of a transverse wave. But for a longitudinal wave, the medium is being displaced in the same direction in which the wave is being propagated. And so uh, in the case, let's say we've got a speaker and the speaker is kind of directed off in this direction. And what you're gonna find is that if that speaker vibrates and kind of thumps, if you will, so it is forcing air molecules closer together in one area, but where those air molecules have left right behind it, they're further apart. And so where the air molecules are closer together, we call that areas of compression. And right behind it, where they're further apart, we call those areas of rarefaction. And so the wave actually propagates as alternating areas of compression and rarefaction. So just as kind of the diagram I'm putting up on the screen shows. Uh, the other thing you should know is that uh, even though we commonly think of sound as propagating through air. It can propagate through solids, liquids, and gases, but it does need a medium. So it will not propagate in outer space because there's no medium out there. So, but you should know that it actually tends to propagate faster in the solid phase than in the liquid phase than in the gas phase. So, and that's just something kind of qualitatively to understand. It's not something we will largely quantitatively discuss, although we will start talking quantitatively uh, about the speed of sound within each medium. And that's gonna get a little bit tricky because we're gonna see there's an inverse relationship to density as long as you're talking about just a solid or just within a liquid or just within a gas. It's gonna seem like it might contradict this because so solids tend to be more dense than liquids or gases and yet it has the highest uh, speed of sound, but you're gonna see that there's typically within a medium an inverse relationship to density. So just something to keep straight here. So, but tend to, again, propagate faster in solids than liquids than gases. All right, so sound is a wave, and just like any wave, there's a simple relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. So, and they just simply multiply together to give you the velocity or speed of that wave, just like any other wave. We'll see this is gonna hold true for light waves uh, towards the end of the second semester topics as well. So, but there's three variables here. You know, two out of the three, you can solve for the third. Now with sound waves, the frequency is uh, what we commonly like to refer to as pitch, and a higher pitch is a higher frequency. So if I modulate my voice to go to a higher pitch, that's actually a higher frequency. Now, as long as the velocity of that sound is remaining constant, like it's uh, uh, set under the conditions of the medium, then as the frequency would go higher, the wavelength would have to go lower. So, but again, that's assuming this, the speed is staying constant because you're within one medium. But what we'll find out is that if, if sound is being transmitted from one medium to a second medium, so, well, then the velocity might change as well. And so that sort of relationship wouldn't necessarily hold true. So now let's talk about the speed of sound in the different phases of matter. So uh, speed of sound in a solid, uh, turns out, depends on the shape a little bit, but as it propagates down a solid rod, we've got a nice equation we can derive here, and it's equal to the square root of the Young's modulus over the density. In a fluid, it's the square root of the bulk modulus over the density. And then for a gas, it's the square root of the pressure over the density. So we see some similarities in the equations that we can derive for these velocities in the different media. Now, if we take a look, so when you've got these alternating areas of compression and rarefaction, what we find with the gas, gases are much more compressible. And so when you, comp you know, push on molecules, so they can actually compress to a pretty significant extent compared to solids or liquids before they start pressing on the adjacent molecules and things of a sort, where say in a solid comparatively, so you press on one, you know, set of molecules in the solid and it's going to almost immediately start pressing on the next and so on and so forth. And that's why in solids and liquids, which are much less compressible than gases, sound tends to travel faster in such fashion. Uh, and we see that it's related to how compressible they are here. So in this case, the Young's modulus and the bulk modulus are measures of how compressible those solids are. 
So, and in this case, we can see not super surprising that they show up here. And then we've got the density showing up in the denominator of each one of these equations as well, as that's gonna play a role. And so how far apart the molecules actually are and stuff like that, again, as one layer of molecules presses on another, it makes sense that how far apart they are to begin with might also end up playing a role in the speed of sound. All right, but from here, these end up just being some simple plug and chug relationships or some simple uh, qualitative relationships that uh, in a solid rod, the velocity is, uh, of sound is proportional to the square root of the Young's modulus or inversely proportional to the square root of the density. So for the velocity of the fluid, it's uh, now directly proportional to the square root of the bulk modulus. So again, inversely to the square root of the density. And then for the gas, uh, now directly proportional to the square root of the pressure, but still inversely to the square root of the density. So inverse relationship to the square root of the density in all three mediums. And again, you might be doing some simple plug-in and chug-in to go with this. Now for speed of sound in air specifically, it does follow this equation for gases. So however, with air, because the composition is, is you know, largely a known composition of mostly nitrogen and oxygen and trace amounts of some other gases, so it's a very specific gas. And the one we're most commonly going to be dealing with in everyday life for the propagation of sound and so we got another equation showing its temperature dependence as well. All right, here is that equation here. And so it starts with a baseline of 331 meters per second. So, and then you can plug the temperature in Kelvin as a ratio over 273 Kelvin. And ultimately what this is mostly accounting for is the fact that as you change the temperature of air, you're changing the density of air. And you could still use this equation to kind of, you know, work your way through that. But because air is something we mo probably the most common uh, medium for sound we're gonna deal with, uh, we can get a much simpler equation, uh, being that's the most common one we'll use here. So if you look at where we're at, zero degrees Celsius, i.e. 273 Kelvin, well, 273 over 273 is gonna be one, and the square root of one is still one, and that's where the velocity of air is 331 meters per second. That's where you get your baseline. So however, at 20 degrees Celsius, commonly known, if you plug in 293 Kelvin here, this ratio of 293 over 273 and take the square root, you'll find out that the speed of air at 20 degrees Celsius comes out to 343 meters per second. Now, one thing to note, we said that, you know, this temperature dependence is largely gonna affect the density of the air, but it's not the only thing. So we said that, you know, air is, you know, set amount of nitrogen and oxygen and trace amounts of other things. So, but humidity can play a role in this as well. So with humidity, you've got variable amounts of water vapor in the air as well. So, and usually this is not a huge factor, but if you've got, you know, a really humid hot day, you might have a fair amount of actual humidity in the air, comparatively speaking, enough to throw the density so off the normal amount. And that could also affect the speed of sound, but something we're not normally going to correct for. So now we're ready to work a couple of examples. And the first one here says, uh, the wavelength of a sound wave in air at 15 degrees Celsius is 1.70 meters. And the question is, what is the frequency? And so there's again a relationship between the frequency and wavelength of sound waves. And that's this guy right here. And if we're wanting to solve for that frequency, we must know both the velocity and the wavelength. Well, the wavelength was given directly, the velocity was not, but we were told that we're dealing with air at 15 degrees Celsius. And that's where this equation is gonna come in handy, which allows us to calculate the speed of sound in air at any temperature. So we gotta find that first before we can find that frequency. And so the speed of sound in air, start with that baseline of 331 meters per second times the square root and 15 degrees Celsius. When you convert that to Kelvin, you add 273 and you get 288 Kelvin. And again, all over 273 Kelvin. And we should now have that speed of sound in air and we'll let the calculator do some heavy lifting for us here. So here we've got 331 times the square root, and I'll use parentheses here, 288 divided by 273, and I'll close my parentheses, and we're gonna get 339.97, I'm gonna round up to 340 meters per second. All right, now that we have both the velocity and the wavelength, we can now solve for this frequency. And if we rearrange this to solve for that frequency, we can see that frequency is gonna equal the velocity over the wavelength, which again is that 340 meters per second over the 1.7 meters. And I chose the numbers here to make it nice because 1.7 goes into 3.4 exactly two times. So, and in this case then, uh, add a couple extra zeros because I was saying it was 3.4, but I uh, had to backtrack a little bit. So the frequency here is going to be 200. Now, what are the units on this? Well, we see here the meters are going to cancel, and you're going to have 200 per second. It's one way to look at. 
which again is a hertz. And so the frequency of this sound is 200 hertz. Let's take a look at another. So in the second example here, an explosion occurs 350 meters above the ocean. How long does it take for the sound of the explosion to reach a submarine at a depth of 350 meters below the surface? And then we're given some constants to use. The speed of sound and air, we're told to use 340 meters per second. Uh, the bulk modulus of water is given as 2.0 times 10 to the ninth Pascal. And the density of water is given as 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. We're also told to assume that these are all constant, uh, which is nice because uh, uh, the bulk modulus uh, of water does change a little teeny bit as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into water and stuff like that. So uh, deeper in depth into the ocean, let's say. All right, so in this case, we want uh, the length of time. And so let's kind of map this out a little bit. We've got kind of our water here and we've got some explosion happening up above the water. So 350 meters above the water. And then we've got a submarine down here. That's an additional 350 meters below the surface. And the question is, is when that explosion happens, how long does it take the, for the sound to reach that submarine? In this case, it's traveling through two different mediums. It's gonna travel the first 350 meters through the air, and then it's gonna travel, some of that sound's gonna get transmitted into the water and travel an additional 350 meters all the way to the submarine. So it's really a two-part problem. So, but that speed of sound is constant. And so this is kind of uh, relating the speed of sound into a kinematics problem. So, and you might recall that uh, for kinematics here, delta y, if we're making this vertical, is equal to v y t. And we'll have that set up in two parts here. So we'll set it up once using the speed of sound in the air over the course of that 350 meter displacement. Uh, and then again with the speed of sound in the fluid over the course of that 350 meter displacement. So and then we'll take and add those two times together to get the total time. All right, well the speed of sound in air was given. So that's gonna be the easier part to calculate here. And so in this case, we rearrange that. Time is gonna equal the displacement over the velocity which in this case is that 350 meters over, uh, and the speed of sound was given as 340 meters per second. I believe I'll double check that. Yeah, told to use that value. So that's easy. We didn't actually have to find that one. They could have given us a temperature, and then we would have had to figure it out and stuff like that. But in this case, making the problem a little bit easier, and it's just straight up given to us. And we can see, oh, this should take just, just over a second effectively. So that's not too bad to do. So that'll be the first half of the problem. And once again, we'll let our calculator do the heavy lifting. But the second half's gonna be a little more challenging here. So because the speed of sound in water is not given. So what we are given though, is we are given the bulk modulus and the density so that we can figure out the speed of sound in that fluid. And we'll do that first. So bulk modulus was given as 2.0 times 10 to the ninth Pascal. So, and the density, 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And once again, we'll let our calculator do some heavy lifting here, although we could probably do this in our head. So two times 10 to the ninth over 1,000 would be two times 10 to the sixth. So square root of two is 1.414, square root of 10 to the sixth is 10 to the third. So, but not a bad time to let your calculator do some work for you. So square root, parentheses, two times 10 to the ninth divided by 1,000, close my parentheses. And indeed, uh, 1.414 times 10 to the third is 1,414. meters per second. So, so first of all, we can see that, oh wow, the speed of sound is quite a bit faster in water, a liquid, than it is in air, a gas, at 340 meters per second. So one of the things we said at the beginning of this lesson is that the speed of sound tends to be faster in solids than liquids and faster in liquids than gases, and that's definitely holding true right here. So, and then we can solve for the time for that second half of the journey, that second 350 meters. So, and that's gonna again equal the displacement over the velocity. So, which again is still 350 meters in the water. And now with that velocity of 14, 14 meters per second. And then we'll just take and calculate these two times and add them together. So first off, we've got 350 divided by 340. We're gonna get 1.03 seconds. And then down here, we've got 350 divided by 1414, and we're to get 0 0.248 seconds.
cool. And I'm doing this in three sig figs. We'll finish this problem off probably with six figs, but I guess uh, in this case, if we're adding these together, so the 1.03, it's going to get us 1.2775 seconds, which will round up at two sig figs to 1.3 seconds. Cool, that's all there is to it. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like and a share. Happy studying.